I went to your show and I got your book. <laughs> oh, did you yeah. like the show? I love the show. I love the show. And you've even like signed it for me. Oh, I'm such a nice person. <laughs> you are, you are. <laughs> have you read it though? Yes, I have. Yeah. And I loved it. I picked it up at your show because I was so intrigued when you spoke about um, being conscripted for the army for the Vietnam mm -hmm. War and your number really, your birthday had not come up. No, that's right. Why did yeah. they do that? It, it was politically expedient. Mm. So we say it, say that. Um, what happened was uh, uh, Harold Holt, Prime Minister of the day, was uh, he sort of followed Robert Menzies' 20-year um, tenure as, as Prime Minister. And he was struggling with it. And uh, the attache, the, uh, the military attache to the Prime Minister's office, because we were entrenched in Vietnam at the time, uh, they had to have somebody there who was immediate, you know. Anyway, he suggested that, Harold, what you need, sir, is, is an Australian Elvis Presley. Of course, Elvis was drafted and uh, he served his time in, in Germany making movies for, of himself. So, they, you know, by hook or by crook, they got me and uh, it, all it did was it took three ballots to get me. And I was by that time, I was the only 1st of February 1947 to actually be called up. I really want... Um to talk to you about that that moment that you found out that your birthday was not really a birthday that was picked out yet to be conscripted. So I was uh, I was driving my little missile uh, Mazda RX five that had had a few tricks done to it uh, along the freeway in uh, the, the eastern. What was it? Yeah, the Eastern Freeway coming into Collingwood. Um, and I was doing about 120 and I kept doing 120 when I was in the 60s zone. And, I, and the officer pulled me over and was looking at, and he said, hang on, hang on. You were born on the same day as me. We dr both drive the same car. Interesting. He said, how come I didn't get called up and you did? And I went, oh, really? But obviously a bit late then, so I, uh, I, I just sort of let it slide and then a few other things came to light and then eventually the, uh, the officer who was the military attaché for Harold Holt on his deathbed told his son that he had to get in touch with me to apologise for what he believed that he had done to me. And, uh, and, that, and his son was a Victorian police officer himself, uh, a sergeant. And, um, and, uh, and I believe the whole thing Im implicitly there, you know. And I believe that politicians will do anything to stay in power. Mm. So I'm, uh, I'm not fond of political animals of any sort. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm certainly not fond of the people who, who uh, do their bidding, you know, in, 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 uh, you know in, in the parliament, the public servants, all those sort of people. Because uh, I got a call, uh, I suppose it was maybe August 67. And, they, and it, I was in Kalgoorlie. How they found me, I don't know. And, and it was a a guy from the press gallery and he said, how do you feel now that you've been called up? And I said, but no, I haven't. And he said, oh yeah, you have. So how do you feel? And I hung, in, hung up in his ear and I phoned my parents and I said, have, you, have I had any, uh, a, a letter in the mail? No. Oh, okay. So four days later, I, we were, we'd moved on and I was at the radio station in Bunbury, at 6BU Bunbury. 
and the phone rang and it was my parents uh, to let me know that they had finally received the mail. So they, the press knew before, before the letter had even been sent. So I just find that, yeah, just disgusting. It was so, such a personal thing. Yeah. Now, what is that guitar you've got over the back there? This. Uh, do you know Martin Cilia from the Atlantics? Don't go away. Oh wow! <laughs> and and you got I oh, you got three P ninety pickups. Yep. Right. So I've got I've got two of the original pickups on. See, and what what uh, what picked my uh, interest was the headstock because it's painted red. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's not actually a fender. No, but it, it was it was the the block inlays on the neck. And I thought, yep. gee, that looks familiar. <laughs> I'll be using that down at the, at Remo. I I can play what I need to play, and that's it. And then I get a proper guitarist to play all the rest. <laughs> um, you're you're very humble, as I can just I just witnessed then also but um you really are legendary like you've done so much in your career um yet you downplay it it's uh, unlike what uh, senator uh, simon birmingham said this has been my vocation he he doesn't believe that performing arts is a vocation he believes it's merely a pastime yeah so uh, I passed my time very well, but uh, you know, when you've been around, I had lunch yesterday at, with some pretty heavy hitters in the industry. Uh, there was there was Tony Worsley uh, from the 60s who had big hit with uh, Velvet Waters. And then there was Digger Ravel, who was quite famous on Johnny O'Keefe's Six O'Clock Rock in the late 1950s. Um, who else was there? Bluey Watson was the bass player of Billy Thorpe's original uh, Aztecs. And the guest of honour of the day was Cole Joy. He was my idol when I was a kid. And for me to actually be sitting having lunch with my idol is, was like, you know, you, you can't possibly be conceited around people like that. <laughs> they, they, they'll find you out. <laughs> yeah. Although I must say, he probably thought of you as a peer. Well, perhaps, you know, and that's, that's another reason for being, you know, just, there's no real point in, in walking around saying I am, because like I said, you get found out. And there are, I know a few people who had that sort of attitude and they, they tend to, um, uh, they seem to slip by the wayside after a while you know it's it's very interesting well the people who've been around a long time like your barry crockers and those sort of people they are really lovely lovely people really nice yeah. and uh, and colin was uh, you know proves himself time and time again to be particularly uh, particularly a nice person When we first no. came back from Vietnam, it wasn't a thing. No. Um, it, there, there was no such diagnosis. And uh, there were many, we lost 10% of all Vietnam veterans in the first uh, two years of them coming back from the war. 10%, 5,000 we lost in, in the first two years of them re returning. And that's, it's just not acceptable. No. And this, it's still going on today. Yeah. Having been diagnosed with PTSD and spending three months in a psych ward, and uh, I, I, I am so across the symptoms and being able to, in fact, so much so that my music director, Roger, was out 
in the countryside somewhere and he was with another band at the time and this, this guy he was talking to this guy and and roger said so when were you in vietnam and the guy said what do you mean and he said you do need to go and see a doctor you need to go and spend time with your mates because you are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and he said how would you know that and he said he said my my best friend suffers from it and i know exactly i know all the symptoms mm -hmm. so you know it's a it's an incredible thing i've read so much about you i've seen so many videos um you had such a status before you went overseas um yeah you were the aussie elvis really um and i love the part where uh you were going for a job but you said you chose your hair over the job crazy isn't it yeah, I was I was actually a uh, what would today be a, a Telstra technician, or a, I think they call them a, a telecommunications engineer these days. So that's what it, what I my uh, title would have been had I finished my time. But I did three years, and it was a lot of knowledge that I gained, and uh, it's helped me to do all sorts of things in the business as well. You know, mm. I know how to I know how to set up. Actually, I was in Pontypridd, where Tom Jones comes from, uh, at one stage, and our PA system blew up, and I tore it, tore it all apart and, and rewired it and got it going before the show, and everybody went, wow. <laughs> and what I find really interesting is the way they um, would promote you. We had a couple of really, really hot PR people, um, and, uh, but I knew how to play the game too. You know, I, I think we all did. All of the yeah. singers in those days knew how to fall into the, into the, what is today the mosh pit. Um, and uh, I mean, have, have a look at Bruce Springsteen. He spends half his life being thrown around the damn thing. So, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we knew how to play it. We knew when there was a photographer around and how to, how to get the right photo at the right time. There was, a, there was a time at the Sydney Town Hall when one of the girls in the audience had climbed around the back, ran straight through the drum kit, over the top of Trotter, into me, knocked me off into the, uh, uh, into the audience, but the audience had gone, apart, gone away. It was like the Red Sea. <laughs> and I went straight into the ground and, uh, Next thing I hear is that my manager and the PR guy say, let him carry you out. And I thought, I actually have no option here. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, I'm dazed. So we get backstage and they said, right, there's, there's an ambulance on the way to take you to hospital. And I said, but, but, and they said, no. So there's this wonderful photo that you you will find somewhere, and there's a guy. I'm I'm like this over the top of a uh, couple of the, the, the security guys, and uh, there was a guy over behind me wearing black frame glasses, and he said, "Okay, now make this look good." And he grabbed me in the side, and I went, "Ah!" Oh! And the photo was on the front page of every newspaper in Australia the next morning and uh, you just, I mean, how do you get better <laughs> a publicity than a front page photo? Yeah. So that was, um, and that was in, in, the, in my last tour before I went into the army. Wow. <laughs> so it was, uh, uh, they were fun days. Now you, they, they build barriers and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. People just, uh, they don't know how to play the game anymore. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They're not allowed to play the game. Yeah, that's right. Uh, everything's oh and s Yeah, and even like I do photography as well, and we're only allowed to take photos for the first three songs and, and have no flash. Yeah. Somebody's got their hand on their private parts, I'm afraid. <laughs> I tell you what, we were doing Go Show Gold. It was the first year or the second year we did it. And one of the 
organisers gets on the microphone and says, no cameras, no photos, blah, blah, blah. And he's wandering around saying, put that camera down and all that sort of stuff, which is bull, you know. That, that horse bolted with the advent of cameras in mobile phones. Mm. So I got up there and I said, now, for this song, I want everybody to take your mobile phone out and all hold it up like this so, and then just sort of shoot the video or whatever, anything you like to do, as long as you post it on you on your Facebook. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, of course, that's better publicity than you can't buy it, you know. Yeah, You've got 3,000 people taking a photo of the stage um, and they're going to post it on their Facebook the next day or that night. It's... Uh, it's, it's just really, crazy and yeah. and i i actually got to to meet pink and spend some time with alicia and because i know her dad who was wow. a vietnam veteran and uh uh she she was exactly she said exactly i've been doing it all of my all of my career always we um you know, we always get everybody to, they said, it's amazing what you end up seeing, you know. During lockdown, I, I uh, bought, paid for, and did the iPhone photography course. Yeah, well, I, I started off with those sort of, actually, I started off, my first camera uh, was a brownie box camera. Wow. Uh, that was handed down by, to, from me, from my brother. And then I somehow got a bellows camera. It had some, uh, some well, it, it, you had to learn about depth of field and you had to learn about, about uh, you know, F-stops, uh, F, uh, F4, F2, F, uh, yeah. F, F8. Yeah. And then you had to learn about, um, had to learn about, uh, uh, you know, shutter speed and all those sorts of things. And you and there was a little prism on the top that you looked at down into the prism to, to frame it. And it was click. And then I went to England and the photographer from um, Consolidated Press in Sydney, Lee Pierce, came with me. And then he um uh he, he lived in he he took the other bedroom in my my apartment and in return, he taught me, oh, we were developing stuff in the cupboard and and all that sort of deal, you know, yeah. and you learn all about, eventually you learn about Ciba Chrome, which you probably, yeah. have, do you know, you're aware yeah. of it? Yeah. Just the best. It's yeah. excellent, you know, mm -hmm. and all the... Do you, have all your, the uh, do you have photos that you've taken from back then? Oh, Yes. There's a big box of them over here. I got uh, uh, quite a few boxes of slides, and I don't know what's on those. Yeah. But it's either in England, our touring in England, and we toured with Gene Pitney and wow. the Trogs and Sounds Incorporated, and, and uh, we worked in the same venues uh, on the same night as the Small Faces, Stevie Marriott. Wow. Um, and so I've got all those photos somewhere there, but I've also got lots of photos from Vietnam so uh, and I've I've been loath to really open those up because I, I don't I don't want to open a can of worms you know it could be so what not much fun to carry over there I'll tell you what I had was what they called an instamatic mm. and it was a 124 um thing uh and you, you just dropped the cartridge in and took the photos and it was a square frame uh, about, I suppose, I suppose three and a half centimetres square, something like that. Uh, they were all right. It was a happy snapper, you know. So, And I also had an Olympus pen. Um, my first camp, my first SOR I bought on in Singapore on the way across to, to England uh, was a Pentax, Pentax S1A. And then I started buying Nikons. Uh, I, I ended up with quite a few Nikons, yeah. um, Nikon bodies and lenses and all sorts of stuff with that. And then, of course, it got to a point where everybody's taking photos with, with uh, mobile phones and all that went by the by. 
Yeah, it's a lot easier just to have your phone on you. Yeah, I, I've got a, I've got an SLR, uh, digital SLR, that mm. I don't. I just, I, it's another thing to carry. Yeah. yeah. And I like to carry that guitar. <laughs> so what we're doing on this show? Yes. Uh, we, you've got a segment in it, which is a, a bit of a teaser for a show that we're putting together with. Uh, we're probably going to use a band about uh, 12, something like that, a big band. And we're going to v visit the early lead up to what rock and roll became. So way be before Bill Haley and the Comets. It's a, a, a song I was listening to the radio uh, and they were playing some jazz stuff and they played an Ella Fitzgerald song in which she sings... Rock me, roll me, rock me, rock and roll me all night long. She recorded that in 1932. That's way before rock and roll. So it was because I always thought that the term was was coined by Alan Freed, who was a, a DJ at the time. But no, that's not right. So um, he might have used it. He might have made it a bit more popular, but it was being used way back in, in the 30s and 40s. Mm. Now, in the 40s, you had people like uh, Louis Jordan and Louis, Louis Prima, Kelly Smith. Uh, we had, um, I mean, even back to Cab Calloway, those sort of people, they were all playing what stuff that was to become rock and roll. And then, um, what's his name? Uh, Big Joe Turner. He, he he actually did the original version of Shake, Rattle and Roll, wow. which is what we've, we're going to call the show, Shake, Rattle and Roll. And, and you listen to it and you think, you know, this stuff was happening 10 years before Bill Haley and the Comets. It's sort of, you know, it changes the whole, the whole perception of it all. Mm, I and I was talking to Cole yeah. yesterday and I said, I said to him, you know, there was... There was a guy in Sydney, and I can't remember his name, who uh, who wrote and and played very early rock and roll before nineteen before six o'clock rock before nineteen fifty six, and he said he said oh yeah that's that was Les Welch. And I went wow so there's a name to uh, to Google and and have a look you know uh, see, because that's the beginning of that style of music for Australia as well. Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, you know, we feature pretty well on the yeah. uh, contemporary music scene. Well done. Before well, that, well, it was we're riding to the Never Never and on the road to Gundagai. There's <laughs> a track winding back to long in your flower. Well, that's up. <laughs> so glad you came along, Normie. <laughs> What would Australia be without you, honestly? Ah, <laughs> uh, who knows? Who knows? There's a lot more that I want to ask you, but I know we're out of time. I'm going to ask you one last question. Actually, two. First one, how would you describe your sound in food form? Food form? Gee, that's interesting, Kit, because my, my partner is a Cordon Bleu chef. Food has changed completely for me since I met her. Um, and she used to own a hotel with her brother in Collingwood called the Grace Darling Hotel. Oh, I and know she, Grace Darling, yeah. And they, they turned it in from a, a local watering hole to, uh, to a, uh, I think they won three chef's hats mm. to a fine dining place, right? Thank so. You. So uh, let me think. My music, my, a, a ribeye steak, it's robust, it's juicy, it's when it's on your plate, it's on your plate. <laughs> um, it's out there and with due respect to vegetarians and vegans, if you haven't had a really good ribeye, then you really haven't eaten. Um, and last question, what is your scene? What is my scene? For me, life is about joy and happiness and, and 
touching touching the emotion emotional engine of human beings so they feel alive that's it and i always say that life should be like a bedspread now you can have a bedspread made of one large piece of cloth and it'll be just a plain bedspread or it could be one of those brilliantly colored patchwork quilts now when you come to your final breath wouldn't you like to look at the patchwork quilt and say wow i did everything i could 